Good evening and welcome to the Climate Summit. I'm Claire O'Connor and I'm the chair for this evening's session, which is our third session of the day. I'm Head of Policy, Performance, Analysis and Communications, which I think we can agree is a catchy title, but I am very lucky to have within my team officers who work on climate change, who is one of the many actions they've been working on recently is this week's summit alongside the Green Homes Grant. This evening's session is Greening Your Home, and in it we hope you'll learn more about what you can do to make your home greener, as well as finding out what grants are available to support this. Our speakers, which we're really pleased to have with us this evening, are Councillor Caddy, who's our Deputy Leader and Cabinet Member for Housing, Andrew Hagger, who is the Council's Policy and Review Manager, Toby Costin from Crew Energy, Giles Reed from Thinking Works, and John Fletcher from Big Clean Switch. The format of this evening's session will start with each of our speakers and then we will have a question and answers at the end where you can pose questions to them. As we're using Teams Live to ask questions, please type them in the chat on the right hand side of your screen. Our aim is to answer as many questions as we can. We won't be publishing all the questions though as part of the feed, but we are keeping a note of all the questions and we'll publish them as some as we go along to give you a flavour of what is being asked. So that we can cover as many questions as possible in the Q&A, we may group similar questions together. So if you don't see your question published or asked, please don't worry. As, as I've said, they are all being captured, but do also be mindful that when questions are published, whatever name you've used and whatever language or vocabulary you've used will appear. You can also turn on closed captioning by pressing the three dots on the menu bar and turning on turn on closed captions. At the end of today's event, please write your pledges in the chat. These are the changes that you pledge to make as a result of today's session. We will be publishing all the pledges from the summit on our council website. So thank you for joining us. We really hope you find this session useful and that will result in some changes to help us with our environment. So for all it leaves for me to do is to welcome our first speaker, Councillor Caddy. He will give you an introduction on greening your home and how domestic energy use contributes to the overall carbon emissions, as well as what we're doing with our social housing stock. Thank you, and I hope you have a really great evening. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you very much for attending this session on greening your home. We're going to be exploring what you can do as residents to improve the energy efficiency of your home and reduce your carbon emissions. We've got four fantastic speakers today who will share information on the funding that's available to green your home, some of the big improvements that you can make, and actually some of the small things that you can literally start doing tomorrow to reduce your energy consumption, and also how you can switch your energy provider to renewables. Before that, I'm just going to briefly say a few words about our Wandsworth Environment and Sustainability Strategy and why it's so important to green your home. Wandsworth Council declared a climate emergency in July last year, and at the same time, we published our climate change strategy. Our target is to be carbon neutral by 2030. And this means reducing energy usage from our buildings and vehicles, switching to clean energy sources, and actually that we really do have a low carbon approach to everything we do. It's about embedding sustainability as a principle throughout the council. But we know that we can't change the borough on our own. So we're working with the community to provide information for residents and businesses on what they can do to reduce their carbon footprint and their emissions. And actually we want to create an environment where everyone can reduce their climate impacts. We've got seven key themes within the strategy and a clear detailed action plan covering all of these, which we're following up on to make sure that we meet our targets. So why is greening your home so important? Well, if you look at emissions across the borough, the council make up just 3%. So reducing our emissions is just not enough. 48% of the borough's emissions come from domestic energy use. So it really is crucial that we all take action to green our homes. And actually taking action means not only reducing energy use and your carbon footprint, but it also reduces your fuel, your fuel bills. And for many people at the moment, they're obviously at home much more. So becoming energy efficient is even more effective. And what are we doing about our housing stock? Well, we've identified some key actions. We're commissioning a stock survey, which is really the key starting point to understanding what our baseline is 
and identifying the most important areas for improvement. But we're already taking action on some of the areas we do know about by doing things like moving to LED lighting, replacing roofs and windows, and exploring technology like ground air source heat pumps to improve energy efficiency. We've got a program of building a thousand new homes on our own land and carbon dioxide reduction requirements on those uh, is 35% currently. and We're aiming to exceed that on all of our schemes. We're also taking advantage of any grant or green funding streams that are available and we've actually already bid for and received some Green Homes grant. Thank you very much for listening to me today. I hope this session is useful and I will hand back to Claire who will introduce our fantastic speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Caddy. Um, our next speaker is Toby Costin. Oh, sorry, no, it's not Toby. I'm getting ahead of myself. It's Andrew Hager. Um, he is our policy and review manager, and he's going to talk to you about the Green Homes Grant and give you a bit more background detail um, on that. So I'll hand over to Andrew right now. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, so we are, I'm here to talk about the Green Homes Grant. Um, so first of all, um, what is the Green Homes Grant? Uh, well, this is a, I'm oh, sorry about that. Um, we've got uh, the Green Homes Grant is provided by central government uh, and is to support the retrofit of homes. Uh, it was launched in late September, so it's still very, very new. Uh, to access the grant directly, you need to be a homeowner or a landlord. So tenants cannot directly get the grant, but you can let your uh, landlord know. Everybody can apply for a voucher uh, to fund up to two thirds of the cost of upgrading the energy performance of up to a maximum contribution of £5,000. So if you wanted to make £3,000 worth of improvement, you would pay £1,000 and the GHG would pay £2,000. For £6,000 worth of improvement, you'll pay £2,000 and the Green Homes Grant will pay £4,000. And for £8,000 worth of improvement, you will pay £3,000 and the Green Homes Grant will pay £5,000. Uh, if you're in receipt of certain benefits, you may be eligible for fully funded support through the low income and vulnerable element of the Green Homes Grant. This means you can apply for a voucher to fund the full cost of upgrading the energy performance of your home up to a maximum contribution of £10,000. This scheme has recently been extended. In fact, it was announced today that it's been extended um, uh, and the vouchers must now be redeemed by the 31st of March 2022. So that's a year long extension on what was previously there, which is very good. Um, so what is the council's role in all this? Well, we have managed to secure uh, funding to deliver retrofit for around 70 homes in the borough with up to £10,000 available for each property. This is different to the voucher scheme. In the, that anyone can apply to and is targeted at those homes where the energy efficiency rating is very poor and household income is low and many of these homes are going to be uh, in or very close to fuel poverty. So these improvements could include insulation, heating controls, solar energy and heat pumps. It's important to note this doesn't cover replacement gas boilers. Uh, the focus of, of this scheme is to get away from gas as a heat source. So if you both own and live in your home, you could be eligible for up to £10,000 of grant funding. If you rent your home, your landlord could be eligible for up to £5,000 of grant funding and they need to contribute a minimum of 33% of the total cost of the works. So as well as reducing carbon emissions, and making homes warmer, we can help reduce your fuel bills. So who's eligible? Uh, so this scheme is not open to all um, and is targeted at those who are most in need. So you must be either an owner occupier or a private landlord. Uh, the household income must be under £30,000 a year and the property must have an EPC rating of EF or G. So your EPC or energy performance certificate tells you how energy efficient your home is, giving it a rating from A, which is very efficient, to G, which is inefficient. An EPC indicates how costly it will, it will be to heat and light your home and what its carbon dioxide emissions are likely to be. And also, crucially, you need to be willing to have the work done on your property. Uh, so we've identified those that we think are eligible and we're going to be sending out letters to them this week. Uh, we're also setting up links with other groups in the borough who may be in contact with people who might also be eligible. So how is this being delivered? Uh, this has been done through a partnership with Retrofit Works, who are a retrofit specialist who are based in the borough. So we're very happy to be supporting a, a local company and creating local jobs through this uh, through this scheme. Um, so 
how it work is we will get in touch with you if we think that you're eligible um, and then we're going to double check your eligibility if you're interested in taking up us up uh, then retrofit works will carry uh, will contact you and carry out a home assessment this is to see what sort of measures can be um, put into your home to improve the energy efficiency and reduce your carbon emissions uh, retrofit works will then talk through the options you have to make improvements and make sure that you're comfortable with them and that you 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 understand them and then you agree what you want and when it should be done and then retrofit works will arrange delivery of the improvements to your home so you will arrange for contractors to come in and carry out the work it's important to note we'll only be using trustmark registered installers so trustmark is the government endorsed quality scheme which means that installers have been vetted to meet required standards and have made a commitment to good customer service technical competence and trading practices so how can you apply for funding so We've tried to identify the people we think are eligible, but we know there may be gaps in our data. So if you think you might be eligible for this scheme, then please do contact us at greenhomesgrant at wandsworth.gov.uk. So get in touch with us and, and we can then assess to see whether you are eligible or not. Um, and just a quick note on uh, COVID and guidelines there. So um, the government guidance is that those working in sectors that cannot work from home, such as retrofit installers, should continue to go to work. Um, and so we would make sure that all, um, uh, all guidelines and COVID secure guidelines are followed and, and retrofit works will be making sure that that takes place. And we will be working with retrofit works to make sure that that, that happens. So we want to make sure that people are safe and reassured that we are, are following protocol in that regard. Um, and so also want to um, just highlight the advantage of going via us rather than applying yourselves via the voucher scheme. Um, one advantage is that we will sort out a lot of the admin around it. So we will make sure that um, you can access the voucher, the voucher gets paid through. You don't have to deal with the voucher yourself because we will handle that. Also, you're going through um, a, a reputable retrofit provider uh, in Retrofit Works who have access to a wide range of um, installers and, and work with lots of different um, installers that, that, that match the requirements that, that are needed. Uh, they will plan out the works and they will do those assessments. So we feel that um, by going with us um, via the voucher scheme, if you're eligible, um, it will make everything an awful lot smoother. And so uh, next steps. So basically, if we contact you, please do respond. Please let us know that, that if you want to take this up. And if you think you're eligible and we haven't got in touch with you, get in touch with us so we can establish whether you are or not. And if you're not eligible, please look into the Green Homes Grant Voucher Scheme. As I mentioned before, um, it's been extended, so there's more time to look at this, more time to do it. Um, at the moment, um, a lot of the Trustmark installers are very, very busy at the moment, but hopefully with the extension that's been, been granted, um, that will become a little bit easier. And also, if you don't want to take part in the scheme, there's lots of other things you can do to green your home. So please listen to the um, other presenters here today um, who will give you lots and lots of tips on what you can do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and I just wanted to do a bit of a proud manager shout out um, to Andrew and Annalisa and Bethany who are on the call, um, because getting the funding bid in for the Green Homes grant for us to be deliver as a local authority was really, really tight. And they worked over the summer to be able to do that for our residents. So I don't get much chance to say a thank you personally. So I'm saying a thank you personally in front of you. Um, before I bring Toby on, I just want to remind you that if you've got any questions, please do pop them in the chat. If you submitted them beforehand, we do have them, but don't worry about resubmitting them. Um, we're looking for questions um, that can be answered. So, uh, so don't hold back. Although when I said that this morning, we then got flooded. So there we go. Um, so now I'm going to introduce a Toby from um, Crew Energy, who's going to focus on the bigger picture, large scale changes we can make in our homes to be more efficient. So over to you, Toby. Thank you, Claire. Hi, I'm Toby from uh, Crew Energy. We're your local community energy group. We're a community benefit society uh, and we look at developing renewable energy projects uh, and energy efficiency projects across southwest London, really. We also have a, a second part of our business, which is community outreach. We run energy cafes trying to help people in fuel poverty. And we also play eco action games with kids in schools, trying to educate them about climate change and climate action they can take in their own homes and in their classrooms. 
Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I should say we're launching our first share offer um, uh, next week. So please keep out for that on social media. So um, what I thought would be a good place to start is a, a typical home's carbon footprint. And when you look at your gas bill, it's broken down into two things, space heating. So all your radiators running, keeping you warm and then the hot water. Uh, and then you've got your electricity bills. And this is pretty much the average numbers that uh, Ofgem use for any calculations. It's a, I think it's a 15,000 kilowatt hours of, of heating demand and 3,500 kilowatt hours of um, electricity. And what we've done there is show you the, your, your net carbon footprint across those four things. It's just about, it's about four tons or in trees terms, 185 trees. So there's quite a lot there uh, that you could be reducing. and some of the other speakers are going to talk about small measures you can do, behavioural change measures and things like that, which won't cost you anything to reduce that number. And I'm going to move into more around the, the, the larger measures that, that, that you can uh, uh, go through and see how you can actually reduce that number. Next slide, please, Amy. So typically when you talk to someone like Retrofit Works, they'll always say fabric first. And by fabric, they mean insulation. So that could be loft insulation, insulating your walls, insulating the ground and having better windows and doors. You can, and the, the numbers around the outside there show how much you lose. So typically 35% through your walls, 25% through the roof, uh, 25 through doors and windows and 15 through the ground. We've given you some ideas, rough ideas. We're, we're not an insulation specialist, but these numbers have come from uh, the Energy Saving Trust and the Carbon Trust just give you an idea of how how much it can cost. And one of the big problems we face across Britain is lots of old housing stock. And, and you know, Wandsworth is a brilliant example of that, where we've got lots of 1890s, 1910 builds. Um, there'll be single or double brick buildings, so no cavity to fill, which is a relatively cheap way of, of insulating. But if you've got to look at exterior wall insulation, uh, if we look at numbers over there, you know, detached house might cost 15,000, 20,000 pounds. Terrace, which a lot of us live in, is still six to 8,000 do the back and the front of, that, of, of the property. And I can see one of the questions has been asked about planning permission on putting a, a, um, an exterior wall insulation on, which is essentially like a, 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 a plaster over the top. And maybe someone will come back with an answer on that particular question, but there's lots of issues. The main one being, though, it's a very long payback. If you think that you're only going to save 35% on your heating bills uh, and your heating bills say £600, you know, you're looking at, say, £200 a year savings, but it's costing you six to 8000 for your terraced house, so very slow paybacks. And this is a big problem. We really probably need national policy to address this issue. Um, but clearly there's other things you can do, like loft insulation is relatively cheap. Government regulation guidelines now 275 mil in your loft as a minimum. And you would need that amount if you were adopting things like heat pumps, for instance, uh, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, so, so you can cut a lot of your energy relatively cheaply looking at the other measures. You know, you can get 65% of that heat, heat back in the building um, but uh, without spending too much money. Thanks, Amy. Next slide. So renewables. Um, so there's, there's there's two types of renewables. Renewable generation. That we all know solar PV or, or wind would be a, a renewable option as well. And then there's renewable heat, which is a little bit newer to people. And and clearly it's the direction of travel that we're moving in. We've got rid of coal out of the uh, energy system and now gas is the next dirtiest thing. So everyone's now focused on how we get gas out. And it's much harder because not only does it produce a lot of our electricity, it, it, it heats 90 percent of our homes. So we have a big problem and London particularly has a big problem because most of us are connected to the gas grid. Uh, it tends to be out in the country where a lot more people are off the gas grid. So we've got a lot of work to do. Um, and, this, and the typical solution at the moment is heat pumps. There is a theory about hydrogen going back into the grid and replacing natural gas, but that's a very long way off. So if you want to do, you know, take action now, this this is the way forward. And, and one of the things to think about as well with your gas bottle, it's, it's not just this 2.25 tonnes of, <coughs> of carbon emissions from, from running your boiler. It's also what's coming out of your gas flue, which is nitrous oxide, particulate matter, and carbon monoxide. So some of those aren't greenhouse gases, but they're still pretty nasty. And the particulate matter is a big issue. So th the third biggest um, um, 
uh, supplier of particulate matter in London is our gas flue emissions. And I think actually on Councillor Caddy's uh, slides, we saw that actually heating our homes is one of the biggest things, uh, biggest emitters of carbon carbon dioxide as well in in London. So, you know, I think it outstrips even transport. So it's a really big issue and we've all kind of got to think about what we can do to to alleviate this issue. So heat pumps, the thing to think about on this are one, there's subsidies at the moment. So uh, they run until March 2022. They've just been extended an extra year. And that will pay for a big bulk of the heat pump costs. So if we're looking at that, that price at eight to 16,000 pounds, depends on the size of your house, depends on the type of system uh, you're, you're having. Are you gonna keep your gas boiler, but get the heat pump to do most of the work? That will be the 8,000 end. If you've got a really big house and wanted a very nice looking heat pump, the 16,000 is the upper end of that scale. Um, so, you, so you really need to think about uh, the RHI and what that might do. And, and, and our, you know, a, a good sized house, the maximum you can get is around about 12,000 pounds over seven years. So you can get pretty much all your money back uh, from the RHI over that period. Um, insulation is a factor. So one of the things you will have to do is make sure you've got loft insulation of 275 mil. If you are in a F or G rated property, heat pumps probably aren't going to work for you because they run at a lower temperature. The heat pumps typically run at 50 degrees, whereas your, your gas boiler is running at 70. If you've got a condensing boiler, it should be running about 60 degrees, but we're all so used to having our, our houses running at 70. So they're not actually condensing, which makes them much, much less efficient. Um, the other things to think about are size. So these things are just under a metre squared and about 400 mil deep. So they're sizable. So where are you going to put them either at the front or the back of the house? They have to be a metre away from your boundary wall. And then noise is a factor. So the quietest ones are 30 decibels and that is whisper quiet. Uh, London background noise is 41 decibels. Um, and then the, some of the bigger, older ones, the cheaper ones might be up to 60 decibels. So you've really got to think about that. Now the sound gets quieter the further away you get two metres away, that 60 drops to maybe 40 decibels. But if you're, you know, if you're putting, say, on your extension outside your window, you've got to be aware that there's that noise there. Solar PV, I think you know, most people know what, what that is now, and you're seeing it increasingly on people's roofs. Things to think about are conservation areas, which is a big issue in Wandsworth. We have lots of conservation areas. Because there's no subsidy anymore, the subsidy ended uh, a couple of years ago, you've really got to try and use as much as, of, of the energy on site as possible. So what you're looking at is saying, well, I'm paying 16p for my electricity contract. If I can actually use all of my solar PV, I'm offsetting that at 16 pence essentially. And that's how you work out whether it works. Other thing to think about is you might not be at home during the day, but you are at night. So battery storage would allow you to shift and time of use tariffs. So if you can avoid four to seven, you get a much cheaper tariff. So Octopus have a tariff at the moment. If you avoid four to seven, it's really only around about um, nine pence uh, for the rest, rest of the period. So if you can use battery and uh, and your solar PV to, to avoid that period, you can save money. Carbon wise, it's, it's, it's not as good as, 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 a, as a heat pump. It's around about half a tonne a year, but you add those two together and you're really dramatically reducing that four tonnes of carbon with those two measures. Price range there is based on around about two and a half kilowatts and I'm showing the paybacks on on those. Next slide, please, Amy. Thank you. So slightly cheaper measures. I'm going to start with uh, smart thermostats. Um, I think we've all seen these on TV, the, the sort of Nest type type scenarios. And the idea there is you, you've got control from your phone or from a tablet or from somewhere to control your heating. So if you're going to be del delayed in work, what's the point of heating an empty house? You can adjust that. So a lot of the, the, these products, and it's the same with the smart TRVs, it, it's really about the user. If you use them well, they will save you 10, 15% on your energy. If you don't use them well, they won't save you anything. Um, but, but you do have that ability to control remotely and that can be important. Um, so small, you know, relatively small savings, but, but these things add up and obviously they're much cheaper things to start with. So if you haven't got a very big budget, think about a smart thermostat, 250, 300. Think about smart TRV valves, so your radiator valves, these ones are really clever. You can program in 20 degrees, you can program in times on them. 
some of them like Radbot has a sensor if it doesn't feel body heat in the room it shuts down to the minimum so it keep that room at 18 degrees um, so really clever stuff and, and not that much money some of them can link the thermostat to the TRVs others can act independently so you can choose which route you go and then finally um, LED lighting and there's going to be a bit more talk I think uh, um, from Joel's on LED lighting but I just want to say that LEDs save you sort of between 60 and 90 percent so if we take a um, your spotlights you've got in you know recessed lighting those would be uh, 50 watts a replacement LED would be six watts so that you can kind of work out for yourself how many hours a day do I have those lights on how many days a week how many weeks a year and you can kind of work out your payback on that but quite often there can be one to four year payback it's a pretty sensible thing to do obviously some of the stuff that, that's simple retrofit is like a golf golf ball bulb you can do those yourself so hence the reason I'm saying two pound cost that could be your bedside lamp you, you could start with that so there's very easy steps here um, the other great thing about LEDs is they last a whole lot longer. They last 30,000 hours, which for a normal household is probably a lifetime. Um, you know, if they're on like four hours a day, you know, that, that's that, that's not very much. And you're not going to have them on in the summer it's so much. It might only be two hours in the summer. So um, so you can kind of work out quite quickly that it's, you know, the last 30, 40 years. Um, so I've talked about all of those. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it from me. If there's any questions, if anyone that's going in contact with me um, on the next slide, there's my contact details. So please get in contact if you'd like to know more. Thank you for your time. I think we might just be having a technical issue, so just bear with us for a, a minute or two here. I'm getting lots of waving from Amy, which I assume something's gone wrong. There we go. Thank you. It's come on to me. I was waiting for the, the red box around me. Um, so thank you ever so much for that, Toby. Um, I'm now going to um, invite Giles Reed from Thinking Works to, um, to talk to you about tips that we can do to make small changes to reduce energy usage in our homes. So over to you, um, Giles. All right, we're having some problems sending people live at the moment, so um, if you can just bear with me. I don't know how big my face is looking on the screen. I'm a bit, yeah. But anyway, do keep keep putting the um, the questions in the chat, um, and we'll get Giles with you um, shortly. We're frantically trying to move everything live. Giles, here we go. Oh, brilliant. So I hope people can can see me here and hear me say, um, my name is Giles. Uh, I'm the director of a, of a not for profit organisation called Thinking Works. Uh, we specialise in, in energy efficiency and essentially um, whereas uh, our main sort of role is, is to help those at risk uh, of fuel poverty. We help around sort of uh, 1500 households a year uh, to help lower their costs and uh, and hopefully save them, save them both money and energy. What I wanted to talk about uh, following on from Toby, is low cost and no cost ways to save. Um, this is mostly because I, like many, um, would like to do some of the more major things, but at the moment I'm kind of saving the pennies. So this is more of a section about things we can all be doing right now uh, that, can, that can make some a really big impact. Um, when I thought about putting this together, I thought, well, we can either look at sort of broad things or uh, use a sort of a, a, a sort of a, a real case scenario. So I thought what I would do is use my, myself. I'm, I'm a firm believer in uh, practice what you preach. If we're going to be out there telling people to to save energy and carbon, I should be doing it myself. So um, what I wanted to do is use myself 
and the way that I sort of run the, the household as an example. Um, and this is based on the fact that, that I have bills for the last seven years. Uh, our gas and electricity bill has been between 44 and 48 pounds a month. Uh, and our water bill has been between 220 and 240 pounds a year. Um, and it's important to know what sort of a household that is. Part of what I'll, I'll talk more about later um, is how important it is to look at your own individual circumstances because the number of people you have in your home, how often people are at home, uh, these are all major factors in how much energy and water you use. Um, so the household that, uh, that, that we have, I've got a, a house built in 1917. It's a mid terrace house, uh, good insulation in the loft, solid walls on the outside, no insulation on those and a gas boiler. Um, so that hopefully gives a bit of context. Um, double glazing, UPVC at the back. At the front, it's wooden double glazing, but it was just wooden single glazed windows with some secondary glazing that I put on myself. So how have we achieved these bills? I'm well aware that for, for a normal sort of household, and I should say that it's also the household makeup. So it's myself, my wife and a five year old. And that's what we've got to live in it. Um, so you can sort of compare that in context to yourself. So how, how have we got bills that are currently paid £48 for gas and electricity? Um, and I realise that that's, that's pretty low. So uh, how has this been done? So there's been some low cost things that I've certainly done. And Toby mentioned LED lighting. And um, this is the, the number one thing. This is huge savings. I replaced the, the 50 watt down lights with 5 watts. All the 60 watts um, uh, are between 7 and 9 watt replacements are in there. Uh, and it, it cost me about £100 to do the whole place. Um, payback period for it was about a year and a half. So I cannot stress more that the LED lighting throughout is a really, really, really important way uh, of saving if, you, if you're trying to do things on a, on a budget. Um, the next up is, is draft proofing. Now, despite the fact that there is uh, supposed to be UPVC air glazing at the back, it was in when we arrived here and there's all kinds of problems with it, gaps, all kinds of stuff. And I went around the, the whole of the house, essentially using my, my fingers to test and see where, where are we losing heat, where are drafts coming. And I've used various fillers uh, and different draft proofing strips to, to essentially make sure that there's no drafts coming through there. And um, similarly, we have two um, open fireplaces, but we, we don't use them. So uh, a couple of doors down was doing some uh, extension work and they had some uh, fiberglass. And I said uh, uh, fiberglass insulation, rock, all the kind of stuff that you put up in the, in the loft. And I said, do you mind if I take some of this? I said, absolutely fine. So took some of that, put it in a, um, a refuse bag and that went up uh, into both the chimneys and stopped the drafts coming down from there. And that was it's pretty significant and made some some good changes. The next one is about controlled ventilation. Um, heating a home is as much about heating uh, as also you don't want to block it up too much. You've got to make sure that there's, there's good ventilation in there. And um, on this side, hopefully you can see in the middle, there's a little um, white vent in the pictures there. and our home is, is a typical house where you have the, the two um, double bedrooms and you've got one little box room and the little box room has got a um, a little air brick up in it and that just if you didn't cover it or have any way of controlling that ventilation you'd have 24 hours a day making that room freezing cold. So all I did was get a cheap little vent on it, put it over it and all it means is that during the day I keep it closed, there's no need for that ventilation and at night uh, open it so there's ventilation while someone's sleeping there and, and they're breathing so it's, it's important to have that but essentially it gives that that control. Um, the, the last one is small energy saving measures. Um, now these can, I mean Toby's already mentioned some great things like the, uh, uh, the, the smart thermostats uh, and other things that can be looked at. There's, there's also things like radiator reflector panels so if you, you, this is foil that goes behind the radiators you can either buy that you can even just take sheets of foil that will still reflect the heat back in cheap to do gives you some good savings of all the small measures I have though it's my uh, it's actually not latest purchase but it's one that's become into more use since lockdown and it's my little friend here that I hope you can see which is a hot water bottle I get asked a lot we get asked a lot as a an organization now uh, a lot more of us uh, are at home and spending a lot more time there um, how do we keep the bills down so in our case, and this obviously it's different depending on your household makeup, but for us, um, the situation is that my, my daughter goes off to school in the mornings and then myself and my wife are, are working away here. And the way to avoid turning on the heating is essentially we've 
positioned ourselves so we work in the south facing part of the house and we have a hot water bottle each and use one for the entire day don't need anything else it goes behind my chair or goes on my lap keeps me toasty and warm and it's a very very cheap and cost effective thing to do um, so it's certainly something worth bearing in mind. But so those are all sort of little cheap things that you can do and collectively they, they help to save. There are also some things that don't cost you anything. And this uh, is that Thames Water have a load of, of water freebies. There's a picture up here, uh, water saving shower head. Then there's a, a, a tap aerator for the bathroom, one for the kitchen. Uh, then we've got a, a system water saver that goes in the toilet and a, um, a shower timer. We're sometimes asked what is the sort of the connection between water saving and energy saving? Well, with the, for instance, the, the, the shower head, if you're using less water, you're heating less water. And that means you're going to be spending less on both your water bill and on your heating bill for that. Um, things like the tap aerators, again, you're going to save on your water bill. Um, and same with the system water saver. The, uh, the shower timer, each minute you're using, uh, you're saving on being in the shower, you're obviously using less water, and particularly things with like an electric shower, which I'll come on to in a bit, um, can make some really significant savings. It's worth knowing that um, even though you may not uh, necessarily, if you're not on a water meter, save money by saving the water, you are going to be saving carbon. We're lucky in this country, the water we have is, is very clean. If you wanted to, you can you can drink water out of the, the top of your, your toilet because it's all made to be potable water. It uses a huge amount of energy to, uh, to, to keep our water as clean as it is. So any water that we are saving does have significant carbon savings at the cleaning side of it that, that tends to doing as well. So to get these things, um, I've put a little link on the bottom here if it will come up. Yep, so at water saving devices at thameswater.co.uk. Um, you can just use the search engine, type in and go uh, Thames Water freebies and it will come up there and you can order them for you. There's also I think other things on there that they, they've added recently as well. So have a look. But again, it doesn't cost you anything. You put them in and it saves you money. As Toby intimated in, in, the, uh, uh, in the last presentation, behaviour change cannot be underestimated in the effect on how much energy uh, and water that you use. Um, the first picture that I've got here is of, a, of an electric shower. And what, what that is there to represent is that um, we don't necessarily know uh, all of us what in our homes is using the most amount of, of energy. There's been sort of mixed press on, on smart meters. I have a smart meter, I think it's brilliant. I would advise everybody to get a smart meter because it really, really shows you what you're using and when. The reason the electric shower is on there is because um, going back more than more than 10 years, maybe 15 years ago in my in my flat, uh, I had an electric shower. It was called the Triton 9000. And I thought the Triton 9000, what a nice name for this thing. But the, the 9000 stood for 9000 watts. To put that in context, your average kettle uses 3000 watts. Your average radio uses 50 watts. So to have 9000 watts of electricity heating up your water, is extremely expensive and shaving off just even a few minutes from your shower every day really does make um, big savings. But I only found out the amount of energy I was using when I got uh, an electricity monitor. Now we've got smart meters, it's actually uh, a much better way because you can see how much you're saving on your electricity and on your gas, plus it's free to get one. Um, it's basically you call up your energy supplier and, and get one in, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a, a big supporter of those. And um, the clothes horse. So we don't have a tumble dryer, um, which I remember when my, my daughter was born, I thought this is going to be a bit of a, a challenge. How are we going to do this without a tumble dryer? We've got three clothes horses. And I mean, obviously, this is me and I'm just a, a crazy about um, saving energy. This is my, my work and my life. So, you know, I'm, I'm big on these things. But essentially, I move the clothes horses around throughout the day. So in the morning, in the north, you get the, the early sun, clothes horses are there. Then they shift over to the back of the house where you get the southern light and things dry there. In the, in the evenings, you can split them up. Uh, so that, for instance, if we've got heating on in the evenings, you can put a clothes horse next to the different radiators. And so that way you can, you can save there. And it's meant we've never needed to use uh, a tumble dryer. We also do um, an extra spin cycle. So when you wash your clothes, we don't take them out immediately. We set it to an extra spin, I think it's like 1200 
uh, little bit of spin cycles and it and it, and it and it does that for another sort of 15 minutes and the clothes come out a bit drier and then it helps with with that's so we've never needed one um we use a, a bowl for washing up that saves on water and, and heated water in in washing things up uh and and again it's you'd be surprised how much it builds up um in terms of your savings by using a washing up bowl it's a very simple thing i bought it for a pound um it's it's, it's been worth its weight in gold um and the trvs you can get the smart TRVs, but you can also just move them yourself. I mean, this, this obviously isn't the thing if you're if you're me, but if you're um, at home or you can change them. That's what they're they're there for. So depending on how the temperature is in different parts of the home, I am going around and actually using the TRVs and changing the setting and testing things to see which is you know the the, the best settings for different rooms and seeing that, that things can change over different seasons. Um, the the last picture there is of a, of an internal door because I've got internal draft proofing on all of the uh, the doors around to make sure that we're controlling uh, the, the drafts in the in the home. Uh, that again, like in many things, it's just about uh, having the control. If we if we want some ventilation in there, you can open the door, but it means that if you close it, that you can prevent that. And again, it keeps the heat where you want it and it saves. So what this says here uh, it is to, to reiterate this really audit your energy and water use. Everybody's home is different. I'm, I'm doing this presentation on my home. I'm well aware that everybody else's household makeup is entirely different to mine. But it's really, really important that you uh, just look at how you and in, in your household is using energy and water and thinking, what could you do to, uh, to, to make those savings? There is the Simple Energy Advice uh, service, which is online. I've just put a link there uh, on these slides. They, they give some general um, tips and advice and ways to save, but they're really good pointers about things to consider in your home, uh, about ways that you can save. So you can go online, uh, check out Simple Energy Advice Service. It's a really, really good place to, to start and give you some pointers of what to look at in your own home. So the, the next session section is um, on no cost ways to save, which is with bills and tariffs. Um, first of all, I want to talk about some discounts that are available. Now, these are not available to everybody. So this is for, for low income households or households where uh, a person receives some uh, some benefits. But the, the first one is the, the, the warm home discount. This is a £140 discount that you can get as paid normally off of your electricity tariff, though some of the suppliers will allow it to be used against your, your gas. The reason that they choose electricity is because some people don't have gas in their homes, so they've sort of said, look, we'll make sure it's off of the electric so that everyone can, can access this. Um, and But you do need to be in receipt of certain benefits. Um, if you uh, look online, there's really good information on the gov.uk website about the warm home discount. Um, uh, you can also go and visit your own energy suppliers website and just go to the search engine you're using, put in warm home discount, the name of your energy supplier, and all the information there will come up to see whether or not you're eligible for it. Um, less known uh, and less talked about is a water discount called Watershore Plus. It's a very, very significant uh, discount on your water bill of 50%. Um, this again, you have to be in receipt of certain benefits to access it, but that's a, a very significant uh, discount that you can get. And um, sadly, with the, the times with COVID, we as an organisation are getting more calls from people who are new recipients for, for universal credit. Uh, and often they are households that have a low income that can get this. So part of the advice that we give to people is to then apply for things like the warm home discount and water short plus because they have those uh, uh, really significant discounts. What's there for everyone though is to switch and save. And it's, it's important also to stress that the, given all of the things that we do do to save in the home and to get the bill down to, to £48 a month, a good portion of that is because I hunt around for the best gas and electricity tariffs. Um, so it's, it's, it's a combination of you wanting to lower your overall energy use, but then also uh, pay uh, as, as little for that as you can do. And, and I should say that tariff I have, although it is low, is a fully green tariff. Um, and I think that John, who's coming next, will talk more about this, but you, you can uh, get excellent uh, tariffs based on renewables that, that offer really, really good prices. And it just needs some shopping around. And I know that there's sort of people have been banging the drum, uh, go and, and switch and save. Um, but it, it really is an important thing. The, the energy suppliers uh, are not charities. 
uh, if you look at your bill and it has the word standard tariff on it, then you can pretty much be sure that you are paying the most. They rely on the fact that uh, people don't uh, have the time or they don't feel that they, they, they want to go and look for, for a cheaper tariff. And if you don't, you essentially pay for that because they're going to give you their, their most expensive uh, tariff unless you, you look for something cheaper. Um, so that in a sort of a, a, a nutshell, I think that's, that's pretty much everything that I wanted to, to cover in this in this short session um, are the areas that you can think about that are from low cost measures, behaviour change and the tariff that you, you're on to try and, and, and find uh, very affordable ways that you can start saving now. Um, please do put any questions for me uh, in the chat and uh, we'll answer them as a, as a panel when the uh, the presentations uh, are finished. But I think um, John's up next to talk more about uh, tariffs and, uh, and and billing as well. So I'll, I'll hand you back to uh, to Claire and, uh, and I guess we'll um, discuss more when we see what uh, questions come from the chat. Thanks, Claire. Um, almost left myself on mute then. That would be uh, not a great thing to do. Um, so Giles did a really good introduction just then for John. John Fletcher is from the Big Clean Switch and he's going to explain about switching and the importance of choosing a green energy provider. So John, um, it's over to you when the red box goes around you. which it should do in a minute. There we go. Uh, thanks so much, Claire, and thank you for the uh, fantastic segue, Giles. Um, I think perfect intro. Um, so uh, Amy's very kindly controlling my slides uh, today. So Amy, if we could move on to the first slide, that'd be great. Um, so I am a uh, founder of a company called Bracken, uh, which operates a brand called Big Clean Switch. And uh, we are a B Corp that is dedicated to helping homes and businesses in the UK switch to uh, low cost renewable electricity. Um, we uh, all started from a climate campaigning background uh, and have probably had to learn to run a business along the way. Um, and the thing that prompted us to set up Big Clean Switch in the first place uh, was our own challenges in uh, understanding how we could switch to renewable energy tariffs and wading through some of the complexity that appear to be out there um, in terms of which tariffs to choose from. Uh, and we've simplified it for the user by uh, vetting the suppliers that we work with uh, against a, a very strict set of criteria that we publish on our website. Um, and so all you need to know uh, when you arrive at Bicking Switch's website is that we've made a very simple binary decision. Any suppliers that you see listed um, have met the criteria and therefore you can trust that their, their green claims are credible. But in addition, uh, we also vet them for customer service so you can be confident that you're switching to a, a good quality supplier as well. I think one of the interesting things about uh, the evolution of Big Clean Switch over the four or five years that we've been doing this is that we have become more and more aware of how important that customer service element is in helping people to switch uh, to renewable energy providers because such a large part of the market um, is, is disengaged from uh, switching in general. Uh, something like 50% of UK homes have either never switched or not switched in three years or more. Uh, and uh, switching sites like Big Clean Switch will very often tell people that uh, it's incredibly simple to switch, and that is true. Um, but it's all it's all simple to switch when you're for apply for many years. And I think uh, a question has come in uh, about uh, exactly that kind of uh, resident. Um, the, the idea of switching can be an incredibly daunting thing, uh, and so uh, what we found ourselves more and more with the Big Clean Switch is actually hand-holding people through the switching process and we have a kind of free phone number that we encourage people to, to, to use in order for us to talk them through that. Um, it's probably also worth mentioning about the entity that we do support businesses as well. I'm not going to talk about that so much uh, today but if you do uh, run a business and you're interested in switching your energy then um, do drop us a line. Okay fantastic Amy, next slide. So what is green energy? Um, some of you probably, this is going to be familiar territory. Uh, next slide again, sorry, I mean, that was just a, 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 a placeholder. But just to kind of go over the basics, 
Uh, when we're talking about uh, green tariffs, we're primarily talking about uh, tariffs that are backed by green electricity. Uh, and green electricity is electricity that's generated from the elements, uh, by which I mean probably the most uh, kind of uh, popularly known as uh, solar, uh, obviously generated from the sun and wind. Um, but also included in that definition would be uh, power that's generated from rivers and oceans. So uh, Scotland and Wales, for example, have uh, some significant uh, sources of uh, hydropower. Um, and of course, from the uh, de degradation of organic matter, so plants, uh, waste matter, and, uh, and in, in the UK, actually quite a lot of uh, human sewage, uh, believe it or not. Uh, and then finally, although there's not a great deal of it in the UK, uh, we would also include uh, sort of geothermal, so uh, electricity that's generated from the heat in the ground beneath our, in our feet in that definition. It's probably worth saying that um, there is some debate over whether or not uh, nuclear would be considered a green uh, power source. Um, we don't uh, work with any suppliers who source their power that went on nuclear, in part because um, we're still ambivalent about the long-term impacts of nuclear, uh, and certainly in terms of the disposal of the waste, in part because we know that uh, many of our users feel very strongly about nuclear, and so it's just a, a much more straightforward to uh, it. The great thing, of course, about renewables is that unlike the key fossil fuels of oil, gas and coal, um, they are much, they have much lower impacts in terms of their climate emissions. So how do green energy tariffs work? The analogy we tend to ask people to use is uh, to try to picture the national grid as being a bit like a great big pond. And uh, a green tariff fundamentally guarantees that uh, every time you take something out of the pond in terms of the energy that you use, um, an equivalent amount of green energy is going into the pond. Uh, and the fundamental principle that underpins that is that if all of us are taking green power, taking uh, power out of the pond that's uh, matched by green energy, then the entire pond has to be green. And that's obviously the place that we desperately need to get to as, as fast as possible if we're really to stand a, a chance of tackling climate change. That's great. Thanks, Amy. So in terms of the impact, actually, some of the other speakers have already uh, covered this a little bit. Uh, if you're switching your electricity from a fossil fuel backed tariff to a green tariff, you can be, for a typical home, expecting to save somewhere in the region of 800 grams to a tonne of carbon dioxide emissions equivalent uh, every year. To give you put that in perspective, that's the equivalent of taking uh, an average uh, new car off the road for about six months uh, of, of the year. So a, a pretty chunky uh, kind of um, figure off your carbon footprint uh, in a matter of moments from switching to a renewable electricity tariff. Um, in addition to the financial benefits, which Giles has been alluding to, and um, I'll talk a bit, bit about um, now, actually, if you could move on to the next slide, please. Uh, Amy. I hope you can all hear me okay, by the way. Uh, in addition to helping people switch uh, energy providers, I'm beginning to think we probably need to uh, look at our own switching to a different broadband provider. So um, I I'm get, keep getting a, <laughs> a little warning thing flashing up, so I hope, uh, hope, hope you're all able to hear me okay. Um, there was a preconception uh, back sort of 20 years ago when green tariffs first appeared on the market that green energy meant expensive uh, energy. Um, that is definitely no longer the case, and uh, green uh, tariffs are now competing with some of the um, cheapest tariffs on the market. Uh, on average, uh, in the first half of this year, homes switching through Big Clean Switch saved uh, £270 a, a year. Um, an incredibly large saving for something that takes such a small amount of time. And that's particularly important now when so many of us are having to spend more time at home. And uh, as a result, uh, our energy bills are going to be increasing, particularly as we're now in the colder winter months. Um, so it's doubly important that we're able to uh, help people uh, with the dual uh, kind of task of helping them to take action on climate and helping them to reduce their uh, energy bills uh, at the same time. Um, energy pricing is complex, so there's a strange disconnect between uh, the uh, cost of renewables and the cost of green tariffs. It, it isn't necessarily true that as the cost of renewables falls, the cost of green tariffs falls uh, in close correlation, but it is true that the more renewables we get onto the grid, the cheaper our energy should become in the long term, and that's because in terms of the generation cost, uh, renewables are already uh, cheaper than most forms of fossil fuels and nuclear. 
uh, and that's just an incredible sign of the speed with which we've been adding renewables to um, our power supply globally and, uh, of course, within the UK as well over the last uh, 10 to 20 years. That's great. Thanks, Amy. So, uh, I'm going to hammer this one uh, quite a bit. Switching your home is easy. Um, for most people, it's pretty easy and straightforward in terms of kind of just uh, going through our online form. Uh, but as I said, uh, if you have any questions or any doubts at all, because there are a whole range of uh, complexities within each home's individual setup. So if you've got an economy seven or an economy 10 meter, uh, if you're on prepay meter, if you've got different kinds of meters for one electricity or gas, uh, if you're worried about smart meters, all of those questions, do just get in touch and drop us a line because there's very few things that we haven't heard in the last four or five years. Uh, and we're very keen to provide the support that we can. Um, next slide, please, uh, Amy. Uh, so in terms of the process, um, I've really boiled it down here, but uh, grab a bill um, and go to uh, bigcleanswitch.org. Um, you'll fill out a series of questions. Uh, one of the things that we stress to people is that there is um, all of the information that you need when you're getting a quote is on your recent uh, bill from your recent supplier. All suppliers are, have to pr provide that information on every single bill. Some of them make it very hard to find on the bill. And again, if you give us a ring, we can kind of talk you through uh, things to look out for to make it easier to spot. But it will be there because uh, it's the you have to include it. Um, and it makes the process of getting a quote dead simple. Um, once you've got your quote, you can pick your tariff from the suppliers uh, in our list. Uh, and then you just pop in a few more details in order to set up your new energy account. And then that really is everything else from there is handled for you. So. Uh, your new supplier will contact the old one, uh, let them know that you're leaving. Uh, and then the only thing you're likely to need to do uh, as you approach the date of your switch, which will happen about two to three weeks later, uh, is provide a meter reading, which will, again, be used by both your new supplier in order to start your billing, but also passed to your old supplier so that they can issue you with your final bill. Again, if you're familiar with the energy market, Kasim uh, kind of, oh, well, some people kind of um, apologize for asking silly questions, but um, if you haven't switched in a long time, they're not silly at all. They're very real concerns. So I just wanted to address a few of those now. Um, the first of which is if you're switching energy supplier, and this contrasts with the people's broadband supplier, um, there is no interrupt in your energy supplier. There are very strict rules in place that make it very hard for you to be disconnected from your energy because it's such, such a fundamental need for all of our homes. Um, so don't worry about there being any interruption to your energy supply. The thing that will change on the day of your switch is simply that you'll start getting bills from a different com company. By the same token, there's no need for engineers visits. You'll still be getting your power from the national grid. Um, there's no changes to wiring or the physical infrastructure in your uh, home. The key difference, as I said before, is that on your green tariff, your supplier will be guaranteeing that every unit of electricity that you take out of the grid is matched by a unit of renewable power going into the grid. And as I said, if we're all on green tariffs, then all of the grid de facto has to be renewable. And that's where we have to get to. You can switch your gas too. Uh, we will switch your gas and electricity at the same time because most homes are on dual fuel tariffs. Um, there are many reasons why we haven't applied the same vetting process to gas tariffs as we have to electricity. And I'm happy to talk a bit more about that um, in the Q&A session if people are interested. Um, but you can switch your gas at the same time as electricity. And just as a side note, many of the savings that people are seeing when they're switching at the moment are coming from very low gas prices. So um, it, 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 that is kind of built into your ability to kind of save significant amounts at the moment. And last of all, um, I'm with Giles in terms of being a fan of smart meters, but you don't have to have a smart meter if you don't want one. And we get a lot of people contacting us who are very uh, sort of uh, firmly opposed to getting a smart meter. The rules around smart meters are you don't have to get one unless you want one. Uh, the only time that may change is if we're 20 years down the line and something goes wrong with your current meter and your suppliers just can't source a replacement meter um, without kind of incurring huge costs. And they may say, I'm sorry, there's, you know, there's just no longer any choice. But right now, um, you don't have to have, to have a smart meter if you don't. Next slide, please, Amy. So just a kind of reminder, and probably it feels apt at the kind of end of the session to kind of talk about this. Um, the clock is ticking. Um, there have been 
Um, even those don't go far enough in terms of uh, catapulting us to uh, a future that is both uh, better in terms of our uh, air quality, our general well-being, but also in terms of avoiding the absolutely catastrophic consequences uh, that will result from uh, a changing climate. Uh, and switching your home business to green electricity is just one of the simplest and most impactful ways that you can uh, immediately cut your carbon emissions uh, alongside the other measures that the other speakers have talked about. Um, this is fundamentally important for all of us to take action on as, as soon as we possibly can. So I think that's enough time to uh, open up for questions. Thank you to all our presenters. That was really informative and I think it's given us lots of hints and tips to um, to be thinking about and changes that we can make. So we're now going to go over to the um, questions and answers. Um, so the first question is for you, Toby. Um, the question is, we've had a number of questions around heat pumps. So when you talk about carbon savings, do the figures take into account the carbon needed to create the heat pump? And also, do you need to spend more on larger radiators and underfloor heating or maintenance? And will a heat pump keep a large Victorian house warm? So over to you, Toby. Uh, so three questions. So the first one, no, um, that doesn't take that into consideration. When, what we're looking at is running costs. So the electricity going in compared with the gas going in and what's the difference in the carbon charge and, and why heat pumps are, are, are much cleaner than um, gas is because they're 350 percent efficient so for every kilowatt coming in you get three and a half kilowatts of, of heat out and therefore you can divide the carbon number of electricity by, by three and a half and that reduces it to say 50 grams per kilowatt hour whereas gas is say 0.184 uh, but that needs to be factored up because your boiler is only 85 percent efficient so that goes up to say 2.1 uh, 2.16 so hence the reason for the difference um, so what's the second question was? Um, the second question was, and nothing you can probably hear me behind Toby's voice. Um, do you also need to spend more on larger radiators and underfloor heating or maintenance? Yeah, so a lot of this will depend on the, the insulation in your home. So if you're a, uh, an A, B, C rated, maybe not. If you're a D or an E, you probably will. So these systems run at 50 degrees, your old boiler was running at 70. So you may need to chunk up your radiators, but probably only in your living areas. You won't have to do that in your bedrooms because the bedrooms only need to be at an 18 degree level one under regulations, whereas the living spaces need to be at 21. Underfloor heating is great because underfloor heating is at 35 degrees maximum. That's all you're allowed to have. So if you're running at that level, your heat pump will be much more efficient. The, the, the further you push your heat pump, the more efficiency you lose. And sorry, the third one was. And the third one was, will a heat pump keep a large Victorian house warm? I think we go back to part, part two, really. It depends on how well insulated you are. So do you have good loft insulation? Do you have really good windows? Have you have you listened to Giles's uh, presentation and filled in all the holes since? Those kind of factors will, will keep your house nice and warm. Um, so, and it depends. I mean, if it's Victorian house, it's terrace, two sides of your house is essentially insulated. It's only the back and the front that isn't. So what you will do is you'll have heat loss calcs and that will assess what you would need to do to keep that at 21 degrees in these spaces, 18 degrees in these spaces. Um, so probably have a heat loss calc done and, and that will give you the answer. Thank you ever so much, Toby, for your three questions okay. in one. Uh, our next question is for John. The question is, I get confused comparing different companies' claims about their green tariffs. What are the things to look out for? Um, in some ways, we've tried to ensure that you can bypass that question um, by looking out for them for you. Um, the but to give you some examples of the criteria that we've set for uh, suppliers, um, one is that we don't list any tariffs. Uh, well, actually, let me back track before I start using 
jargon. The way that a supplier guarantees that every unit of electricity that you take out the grid is matched by a unit of electricity, green electricity going into the grid is through something called a renewable energy guarantee of origin. That is a certificate that is issued to every renewable generator when they put power into the grid. And the suppliers have to um, acquire uh, certificates to match the amount of energy they're selling to you. So that's how that works. Now, we don't work with suppliers who source those certificates from large scale biomass. So uh, in particular, that is a power station uh, called Drax, uh, which was a coal fired power station, but now uh, has been converted to burn biomass, which is effectively uh, wood chip and pellets that have been imported from the US uh, and there is a great deal of doubt would probably be the most tactful way of putting it about whether the carbon impacts of that are even better than some of the traditional fossil fuels and in some cases there are suggestions that they're worse so we don't work with any tariff set uh, sources from Drax. Um, another example is um, we believe that in order for uh, your consumption of green power to have an impact in terms of a demand side driver of the growth of the UK renewable energy market. Um, the power that you're uh, buying should be matched by renewables from the UK. So we don't work with tariffs where the renewables are matched by the equivalent of a Rego sourced from outside of the UK because we think that uh, the uh, as you as a user will expect that the power that you're buying is helping to contribute to the growth of the UK renewables industry. Um, so those are just two examples of the sorts of considerations that we've taken into account, uh, hopefully making it easier for you to just simply make choices based on uh, other criteria and the most common one is obviously cost. Thank you very so much, John. Uh, we've got another question for um, Toby. The question is, we have several, well, we have had several questions about flats. So um, one of them is, what are the options for replacing gas boilers on flats where there is no garden or no roof? And also, how else can I green my flat? Sorry, Toby, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um... It's difficult with an individual flat. You would really need to get agreement of the block and then look at options. So you could have a ground array that, that provides a ground source heat pump that will provide into the whole block, or you could have uh, an air source that feeds into the whole block. So there are solutions, but it really is typically a whole whole block solution. If you're on the ground floor, there might be a possibility of having a small heat pump to feed just, just your flat. Um, in terms of the second question, I think that's probably been answered since. I think it was one of the earlier questions, Giles is, you know, uh, 15 minutes clearly gave you many, many ideas and my last slide should have given you a few ideas as well with smart me um, um, smart thermostats and, and smart valves will help you control and zone your heating. Thank you um, so much, Toby. Um, question for you now, Giles. Um, I was told Economy 7 would not be available with a smart meter. Do you know if that's correct? Is that, yeah, yeah, no, so uh, no, that, that isn't correct. We've had a few people call up where this has been claimed. You can get a smart meter with Economy 7. There is no technical reason why you can't, but it can be harder to install. Um, I had a, a chat with uh, with both EDF and, and E.ON about this. Um, and what seems to have happened in some cases is that smart meter rollout has uh, different organizations have, have been given contracts to do it and it is harder to put a smart meter in. I think you maybe need what's called a SMETS 2, which is the second generation meter for it. Um, and so uh, where people either have a SMETS 1, which is the first one, uh, they've kind of said, oh, we can't put it in, or where contracts are being paid per piece and it takes them longer to do it, they've said that they, they haven't been able to do them. But yeah, there, there is no reason why an economy of seven meter cannot have a SMETS 2, which is the second generation of, uh, of smart meter put in. There's no reason at all. Can I just um, add to that very briefly? Um, so it's John, I think um, that it was already mentioned in relation to uh, time of use tariffs and Octopus has a, an agile tariff that uses SMETS 2 smart meters. Fundamentally, an economy seven meter is just a fairly primitive form of time of use tariff. So you're getting a lower cost of energy 
at some parts than others. And actually, one of the huge areas of possibility for SMET two meters is the fact that they can function uh, as economy seven meters or uh, as kind of l- lowering and raising the price at various times of the day. So um, Octopus also offer a different tariff for, for EV drivers where you get uh, a very cheap rate for five hours uh, overnight. So um, kind of it's new economy seven with SMET two. Uh, as Giles said, SMET one was a bit more complicated, but um, it, in actual fact, SMET two is almost designed to facilitate you having economy seven or, or similar. Thank you ever so much. Um, our next question is for um, for Andrew, but everybody else do chip in if you've got anything to add at the um, the end. So the question is, as a tenant, what are your top tips for how to encourage my landlord to make changes? At the end, he is not the one paying the energy bills. Uh, yes, so that is um, potentially a bit tricky. Um, one thing uh, to, to highlight is that uh, in 2018, there were requirements brought in um, that all uh, all landlords have to have um, an NG rating of E or above on their properties for new tenancies. So if um, if they want to let that ten that property again in the future, then they need to be an E rating or above, and that's currently now. Um, and with the announcements today by the government around um, increasing um, efforts around greening homes and things like that, it's not unfeasible that that could change in the future. So um, there is free money available now to landlords. Um, and so um, I, I imagine landlords would not want to turn that down. So I think just highlighting that, the, you know, this stuff will need to be done at some point in the future. Um, highlighting that, that there's um, a big subsidy being offered if effectively to, to get this work done um, and so that will enhance their, their value and enhance um, the, the future um, value of the property perhaps um, that that could be one way of doing it but it is potentially a bit tricky because if the landlord's not really thought about it that much it might it might be something quite new to them um, and they have hadn't considered it, so it, it might be a bit tricky. I don't know if anyone else has got any suggestions around that. Uh, only thing for me would be, um, I believe there is some evidence that improving energy efficiency uh, has a bearing on house price value, and that is only going to increase with the increased government focus and uh, initiatives because there's going to be greater awareness within the uh, state agent industry, for example, um, of the benefits of having a, a kind of a warmer home. Uh, and so landlords can potentially increase the asset value uh, of their homes by making improvements to the energy efficiency rating. Uh, and I think that's probably uh, potentially a significant motivation, sorry, motivation for many. Not that you want them to then sell the house from under you, but um, yeah. I'd also say check out epcregister.com. Uh, to see if your um, EPC is an FOG. If it's an FOG, come come next year, they're not going to be able to rent that property. So then you can clearly put pressure on and come to the council and say, yeah, I'm renting an FOG property and, and, and let them help you. Thank you, everybody, for those answers. Um, next one is for Andrew as well. So how will today's announcement that the closing date for applications for the Green Homes Grant affect the way in which the council administers its part of the scheme? And will the longer time frame facilitate cooperation with South Thames College to provide training for jobs in this sector? Thanks. So this was only announced today, so we haven't uh, actually been able to um, ask Bayes, um, which is the, the government department running this, whether this is going to impact on the scheme that we're delivering. We think it probably won't because there's other funding that's available. So the, the funding we've secured already, we think we'll probably stick to the, the delivery timescales we've got, which is quite tight with March 2000, uh, March next year, 2021. But there are um, subsequent um, Green Homes Grant funding that, that's going to be available and we will be bidding for that. And those will have longer timescales. And we hope as part of that, we can start to talk about um, some of the, the green skills that are needed to support that. So for example, we, we're working with Retrofit Works and, and, and we're going to be having a conversation with them uh, around that longer term stuff that can happen. Um, we've already had initial conversations with South Thames College around uh, green skills 
skills and, and how we can work together around that. And I'm going to develop that in the future. So hopefully with today's announcements that there's going to be some funding available and it'll be longer term, we can start having those conversations knowing that there is funding there to support those jobs in the longer term um, and not just in the short term. Thank you. Um, our next question is for John. Um, so just to recap, can, how can one electricity supplier be more green than another when all electricity is shared via the national grid? Um, so, I mean, I, I guess uh, as, uh, as a first point of principle, um, if your supplier is guaranteeing that they are matching every unit of uh, electricity that you take out of the grid by uh, a unit of green electricity going into the grid. Fundamentally, uh, they are, you are, that is a different proposition to a supplier simply um, kind of sourcing their power from anywhere. Um, we get asked a lot about which of the tariffs on our site is greenest, and, and we've very deliberately tried to steer clear of that because um, in part, that's a really subjective question. So, for example, uh, Octopus is owned by one of the UK's largest investors in solar. Um, Ecotricity has uh, developed uh, its own onshore wind generation from a very early stage, although it's still relatively small scale uh, in comparison to um, most of the onshore and offshore wind generation that we've got in the UK now. Um, Good Energy has developed direct uh, buying relationships with uh, a whole range of community projects all over the UK. Um, which of those is better or greener um, is uh, very difficult to quantify in many circumstances. And so um, the nuances of those providers will, uh, and which of them appeal to you, will depend uh, on your personal kind of preferences. Um, the, which is one of the reasons why we don't get into that. I think one of the things we've reflected on over the last few years is that uh, there are some uh, consumers who would like to know some of that information. Uh, and so the next uh, rollout of our uh, platform, we aim to make the results a bit more sophisticated so that we provide a much greater level of detail on the suppliers at the top of the list, because those are the suppliers that most people tend to be most interested in, um, to allow you to make a, a more informed choice if you want to without confusing or putting off people who just want to know that we've done the hard work for them. Great, thank you. Um, and then um, we've got a question that we're going to ask multiple panelists, but I'm going to start with um, Giles. So um, just thinking back over all the advice you've given, what are the key things I should do to get my home to a net zero target? So we'll start with you, Giles, if that's okay. Yeah, no, that, that that's fine. Um, I mean, certainly, obviously, I'd say that the the first port of call is to audit your yourself, your household, and 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 where the the pinch points are. And it's why I do like a smart meter because it's a very good tool in working out where those things are. I mean, as as a prime example, so I mean, I'm in a mid terrace house, and as Toby was pointing out earlier, we, we heated on either side, and when I was considering the investment in, in solid wall installation, I, I, I looked at it and I, I ended up measuring the, the amount of area that wasn't glazed and what that would cover. And then I looked at what we were spending on the bills and, and the payback period was sort of 80 years. So it, one, it's, it's always for me, I think, really important to look at first what you're spending, how you can narrow that down by really spending as little or nothing as possible, because that then essentially is, is your starting point the cost benefit of everything else that you look at. So when you start looking at any other larger measure, it will take into account your energy use to see, you know, how much you're actually saving. So um, yeah, for me, the, the first port of call is, is to see really what you can do without, you know, going for something, um, you know, and, and that's yeah probably where, where I would start first. And then once you know that, you can then look at some of the other larger measures. And um, so the one thing that I am considering with the Green Homes Grant that we haven't got done, um, that I think could still make some uh, some very good uh, differences is underfloor insulation. So that's uh, something that I'm personally looking at. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, kind of how I'd approach it. Um, great. Toby, is there any tips you would like to add to that? Sorry. 
Sorry, Toby, you're on mute. We keep catching you out, don't we? I thought, I, sorry, I thought I clicked it. I, I obviously must have just brushed my keyboard. Apologies. I was going to say, controversially for a panel that's meant to be about greening your home, probably the easiest thing you can do is change your diet. So we're building carbon calculators at the moment, so we do assessments of people's homes. And one of the things that stunned me was that we're talking about this four tonnes for our home, but actually four of us on a meat diet, it, that's eight tonnes of carbon. So it's double the amount. So actually switching to a vegetarian diet and maybe bringing that down to four tonnes is probably the easiest thing you can do. Um, so yeah, that's probably my slightly left field tip. Thank you. We're going to go to John. John, got any left field tips for us? No, I'm going to be horribly predictable and say uh, <laughs> uh, because it's because it's so fast, because it saves money, uh, and because it has a fairly chunky impact. Although you know, relative to meat eating, it's clearly um, still still got a long way to go. Uh, switching to a renewable tariff is is definitely the way I would go. I think also one word of caution, uh, not caution, but just for, be careful of your own behaviours. Um, if you are replacing your light bulbs with LEDs, don't let the little niggly voice uh, allow you to leave the lights on just because you've gone for a lower power, you know, a, a lower wattage light bulb. Uh, there is quite a lot of kind of behavioural evidence that suggests that um, the, the devil in us can be uh, kind of uh, quite counterproductive when it comes to some of these changes. So make sure you bank the change, not just use it as an excuse to let yourself off the hook. <laughs> Great tip. Um, and then we've got another question for Giles. It's quite a specific one. What were those tumble, dry, tumble dryer tips again? I never had one and need to boost my know-how. I don't think, I'm not sure if it was a tumble dryer, whether it was your washing machine tip, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's using the washing machine. So on, on our washing machine, it's got a, a setting where you can just do a spin. So it does a normal cycle, which, we normally do it sort of 30 degrees. Um, we have these little washer ball things that go in. I, to be honest with you, I don't think they do a massive amount. The extra spin seems to do a lot more than, than they do. The idea is that they break up the, the washing to allow more sort of uh, I don't know, air to come through it as it's going through. But basically we do, do the standard wash as you would do on, on 30 degrees, um, except for we do do a hot wash for, for towels and the rest of it. And then once it's done, it's got a setting on it and it's just it's an extra sort of uh, I think it's 15 minutes and it does an extra spin cycle and then it comes out much, much drier. And then from that, it's all about um, loads of clothes horses, which is, you know, if, 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 if you can have them in the show, I mean, that's, yeah, you wouldn't believe what it is. It's a ridiculous lifestyle that I lead. But anyway, it's a, it's a good way of, of doing it. So yeah, clothes horses, I couldn't recommend more. You can always stick them somewhere where you're not in much like your bathroom and, and things like that. So. Once you've got your, your washing dissipated in different places, then you're in a, in a position to move things around. So yeah, but the, the extra spin cycle, definitely winner. Thank you for that, Giles. And can I just say, I have a clothes horse that's 20 years old and I still love it and use it. Um, Councillor Caddy, um, sorry, we missed you out. You, um, what is your quick tip um, that you'd like to share? Well, again, it's slightly out of left field, but nobody's mentioned it. But if anybody has children or even knows children, I think getting kids involved in this is something which works really well to encourage the whole family to change behaviours. And certainly my kids who are nine and 12, um, it, you know, they know all about sort of, you know, carbon footprint and saving energy. And they're always telling us to turn the lights off if we forget. And they've switched from baths to showers and they just love to be able to see the, you know, the sort of actual impact of of saving energy um, so I, I would say pass it on to the next generation share it with your family and get the kids involved because it really does help with with family behavioral change and um, it also brings up a, a generation who are aware of what's going on and who are um, also you know working hard to try and save the planet thank you very much and we've got another question which is around um how do I find a local builder with green um, credentials? Who'd like to go on that? Toby Giles? Giles? I'll take it. Oh, it's good. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, no, so the, the, 
the way at the moment, I suppose, from from the sort of the the, the party lines that were is to go with it with a trust mark uh, accredited installer, because that way you know that they've gone through uh, a rigorous set of, of accreditations to make sure they're reputable. The issue at the moment is that most of the trust mark installers are up their eyeballs with trying to quote because of there just isn't the uh, at the moment the, the supply to meet the demand. Um, what we, we get asked a lot about trying to find sort of uh, reputable suppliers, both on the green credential side and just on them being really good. And if you if you can't get a hold of a trust mark um, provider at the moment, what we strongly suggest is, is like with, with most things, speak to the people in the community, speak to neighbours, speak to anyone who's had the works done and find out who's done it. Um, I mean, I, I've just been chatting to, to the neighbour over some things that they're doing because I've, I've seen that the work that's been done there is really, really good. Um, and so finding that if you see something that's good, um, always having a chat with somebody. I, I was in a, a Borough Merton um, maybe a few months ago um, and I saw a house was getting some solid wall insulation. So I just started chatting to the builders there and then I've had a look at the work they've done and it looks really, really good. So if I would say Trustmark is, 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 is a very good place to start um, and also just word of mouth. If you can see the work has been done somewhere and you're happy with it, that's it's always a very good place to start. Thank you ever so much. That's a really good um, tip. So um, I'm afraid that's all that we've got time for now for um, questions. Um, I'd just like to say another big thank you to um, to all of our speakers who I think have given us all really practical takeaways that we can um, we can take away and make changes in our day to day lives. All that's left for me to invite you to do is um, write your pledges in the chat. So hopefully our, um, our panellists today have given you lots of tips that you might think about making changes. So if you'd just like to drop those in the chat for us um, and so we can get a sense of kind of the impact of the, um, the session and we'll publish those anonymously um, when the week is over. And just to say as well that we have um, more sessions going on this week. So do go to our website and um, we've still got spaces for the transport session tomorrow morning and the green spaces at um, lunchtime. Unfortunately, our how to get involved is signed, fully signed up, but we also have some smaller sessions running tomorrow and Friday as well. So please do have a look and um, do join in. And I suppose all that's left for me to do is say thank you so much for spending your evening with us and being interested in us as a borough making a difference. Thank you. Um, 